Uh, we have quite a lot to get through still. Uh, we have six speakers, I mentioned before, uh, representing, uh, I guess they're representing five units on campus, apartments and other uh, units on campus, uh, so they'll be talking from different perspectives. Uh, they're all going to be speaking for a few minutes, and we're gonna, they're all going to speak first, and then there's going to be time for discussion and questions. So please uh, note down any questions you have or any points of discussion that you'd like to bring up, and after everybody's spoken, then we'll have hopefully plenty of time for people to raise questions or, uh, or discuss uh, some of the issues that are raised uh, during the presentations. Um, I'm in the interest of saving time, I'm going to introduce two speakers at a time instead of one. Uh, so the first speaker is going to be Aaron Miller, who has a PhD in criminology and criminal justice from the University of Maryland, uh, manages the Global Terrorism da Database at START, the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism in Response to Terrorism, which is based on campus. The Global Terrorism Database assembles information about terrorist events around the world uh, from uh, 1970 to 2015. Her research investigates patterns of decline among terrorist organizations and movements worldwide using innovative statistical analysis of data from the database. Uh, the second speaker will be Robert Kulish, who is director of M M Law programs, the university's undergraduate law and society program in collaboration with the University of Maryland Carey Car School of Law. He is also a uh, research professor in the Department of Government and Politics and lecturer at law at the University of Maryland uh, Carey School of Law, where he teaches a seminar on immigration law and, and policy. Uh, he is author of Immigration and American Democracy, Subverting the Rule of Law, uh, among other publications about immigration. Uh, he will be speaking about uh, walls, bans, enforcement, and sanctuary. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really great to see so many people here on such a rainy day. Uh, so thank you for, to Lily for the invitation to speak, and I'm uh, really excited about the, the discussion. Uh, I'll start by noting that my research is funded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Department of State. However, the views and conclusions and anything I say here are strictly my own and do not in any way represent uh, the views or policies of the U.S. government. Uh, as you just heard, I manage a project called the Global Terrorism Database. So you might imagine when national security is invoked uh, as a reason or a justification for changes to immigration policy. Uh, we get a lot of phone calls from, uh, from the media primarily, but also from other analysts asking us about patterns of terrorism in the United States and if they reflect uh, the policies that are being proposed or that are being discussed. Uh, I actually don't intend to dwell too much on that topic right now because I think it has been reasonably well covered in the sort of public discourse on this topic, but I'll just very briefly summarize to say uh, that when we do look at the data on who has carried out terrorist attacks in the United States, uh, we don't see any indication that the recent policy changes that have been proposed would have prevented any of those uh, casualties due to those, uh, those terrorist attacks. Uh, like I said, I'm happy to discuss that more later at length, but there's something else that I'd actually like to focus on uh, for my comments here that I don't think actually gets uh, quite as much uh, depth of attention uh, in general and in public discourse on these topics uh, about immigration and, and national security, and that is the strategic objectives of terrorists, terrorist organizations and individual terrorists. Terrorism is kind of a unique type of violence because you have a situation where a demonstrably weaker adversary, a terrorist group, is going up against a demonstrably, unequivocally stronger adversary, a uh, state, a government. Um, you would think that this would never work, right? There's no reason to expect that this demonstrably weaker adversary would be successful or effective at going up against a, a demonstrably stronger adversary, uh, given that they are, in fact, weaker. Um, they shouldn't have an impact, they shouldn't have really long-term successes, and often they don't. So uh, the, the question is, when they do, why is that? When they do have these longer-term successes, what is the reason for that, uh, given this imbalance of, of might, imbalance of, of power? Um, we, we see often that when they are successful at having an impact, causing long-lasting damage, uh, it's usually a result of their strategy more than than actual, than, you know, military uh, strength. Uh, and their tactics are specifically aimed at undermining their dramatically stronger adversary and 
perhaps more importantly, getting their dramatically stronger adversary to undermine themselves. Uh, so it's sort of a, uh, an, a uh, you know, a, a jujitsu. It's you know a, a David and Goliath kind of situation. You have to, to use your opponent's strength against uh, itself. Uh, the fact that terrorist attacks are heart wrenching and, and devastating goes without saying, but it is in fact the case, I think, that often the greater uh, negative impact is about the secondary and tertiary uh, effects of, of those terrorist attacks. <coughs> this isn't really an interpretation. This is a stated goal of uh, perpetrators of terrorism, and it has been for, for ages. Um, and it, you know, it comes through in their statements. Uh, terrorists of all ideological stripes for decades and decades have stated this explicitly that their goal is to provoke a reaction, to provoke a disproportionate reaction on the part of their adversary that would cause them to, quote, show their true colors as enemies of the people. Uh, this would reveal what they believe is an inherent disregard for humanity and it blurs any kind of moral high ground. Uh, and even if, if these terrorists are, are effective, uh, serves to incite rebellion among people who would otherwise be sort of apathetic about uh, about some of these issues. This is why terrorist attacks often target civilians. Uh, they draw attention uh, to their cause, they invoke fear, uh, and they provoke a fierce display uh, of strength in retaliation to these attacks. So what does this have to do with immigration? Terrorist attacks can prompt governments to do things like restrict civil liberties, violate human rights, start a war, uh, compromise core values, all in the name of security and national security. Uh, and while the terrorist attacks themselves and these reactions are problematic and terrible on their face, they also have these second order and third order effects. So alienating and dividing the public, um, uh, suppressing or even crippling economic growth. Uh, you decrease thereby resilience to future attacks by doing this. Uh, in a statement, for example, to Al Jazeera, in 2004, Osama bin Laden said, we are continuing this policy in bleeding America to the point of bankruptcy. It has appeared to some analysts and diplomats that the White House and us are playing as one team towards the economic goals of the United States, even if the intentions differ. With respect to immigration, restricting immigration deprives communities of the valuable contributions of immigrants uh, that, that, that are made to society and to the economy. Uh, it sacrifices the values of multiculturalism, <coughs> indivisibility, freedom, justice for all, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and reports indicate that, for example, the recent uh, executive order uh, about foreign terror entry has been described as the blessed ban uh, by supporters of, uh, of the Islamic State on social media because it proves, they think, uh, uh, Anwar al lakis predictions that the United States will turn against uh, Muslims and they hope that it will incite anti-Western sentiment. Uh, Tom Parker, who is a former policy director for uh, te uh, Terrorism, Counterterrorism, and Human Rights at Amnesty International, writes, the genius of terrorism is that it turns citizens into their own worst enemies. It's not an accident, it's, it's deliberate, it's specifically intentional. So policymakers policy need to negotiate a very difficult balance. It's not easy when developing counterterrorism strategy. Uh, in terms of this strategic goal of undermining a, a, a stronger authority, uh, people who study terrorism are aware of this, uh, whether it's in an academic capacity or in a, as counterterrorism professionals. It's, sort of, it's very well known that this is the strategy. It's, it's literally terrorism 101. It's the first chapter, first day of class, you read the syllabus. Second day, uh, you learn this lesson. Uh, it's not also uh, unique, though, that politicians aren't really familiar with this concept, right? Tough on crime is usually more resonant with voters than smart on crime. Uh, and so it is a challenge to insert this message, this, this uh, familiarity with this tactic into uh, the public discourse on this topic. But I think that, uh, that it is certainly a critical uh, piece of counterterrorism strategy. Thanks. Hello, my name is uh, Robert Kulish uh, from MLAW Programs. Um, just going back to the exercise very quickly, um, the roots of my last name is Green. If anybody wanted to know. A Bulgar kind of 
and I'm happy to talk about it. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me to be part of the panel. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about my research, but um, similarly, my research isn't going to be the basis of the talk, but I think it will provide additional context, and I will try to weave it into the talk as I move forward. So, um, over the past two or three years, I've been uh, working to get data from the uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, on um, uh, information related to risk classification assessments of individuals that are being detained. Um, uh, long story short, we asked nicely, we were told no. Uh, we then began to go through the Freedom of Information Act, and over uh, several years we began, began to get data. Just very recently, uh, we had a settlement um, with uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and we ended up with 1.4 million cases of everybody that's been detained who has been in immigration custody since the beginning of the risk classification assessment in spring 2013 until pretty much the end of the Obama administration in November uh, 2016. So we're working right now with um, 1.4 million cases. We're beginning to find patterns um, and um, we're finding some fascinating things. And if anybody wants to hear more about that, come and talk to me. Uh, after the session. I would like to acknowledge uh, MPower, which is uh, the reason why MLaw exists, and they're also one of the uh, um, uh, sponsors of, of my research. Uh, in addition to that, another possible sponsor of the research is the National Science Foundation, and quite frankly, um, they're making their decision today um, as to uh, whether or not I'm going to be funded this round. So I've been looking at my phone. <laughs> I'm waiting to see status changed rather than pending. Okay, so um, the points that I want to make is that uh, I'm from a group of scholars, international scholars, that look at the intersection of immigration law and criminal law. We call ourselves immigration scholars. That's how we define um, this intersection between these two things. We're critical scholars, and the scholarship generally can be divided up into two groups. Those that really focus on questions of exclusion and the need for countries and states to keep people outside of their sovereign borders. Um, uh, that's really low-hanging fruit for, for governments, and I'll talk about why that is in a minute. And then uh, several of us talk about internal social controls for individuals where there's a need that they come into the country. That need could be economic, it could be political, it could be social, uh, it could be personal, a lot of reasons and then that these individuals are then subject to um, state-initiated uh, social controls that make it that they're here, but uh, they're increasingly vulnerable, um, their uh, mobility is monitored, they're subject to detention, and whereas we all lead misdemeanor live, uh, lives, uh, um, and I got that term from a, a colleague of mine, just in the course of every single day, we always we break laws, right? We, I broke several this morning, I'm not proud of it, I'm not gonna tell you which ones they are, particularly since there are journalists here in the Department of Homeland Security is, is represented. But yeah, yeah, trust me, I did. And my guess is that if I asked everybody in the crowd, we would all raise our hand. Things like, you know, uh, not crossing at the green, but in between, or, or, or going two miles over the speed limit, which perhaps I did. <laughs> So we do that. Um, the problem is, is that in our lives, our, our everyday lives, we're not concerned about that. We don't think that our lives are, we're putting our lives in jeopardy for living these lives. This is the way it goes. This is the way in which we look at law in its social context or law and society. Um, the big argument that my research is, is showing and I'm writing about is that for anybody um, who's not a citizen of the United States, U.S. born or naturalized, but these are for individuals who are green card holders all the way down to undocumented immigrants. So you could have been here for two weeks or you could have been here for 40 years uh, with a green card. You don't have that luxury. Your membership in society as a green card holder is very, very fragile. That if you have an interaction with, uh, 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 with the police because you went that two, uh, you know, figurative two miles over the speed limit, you could find out within very, very short order um, that you're not going to get away with that. Not only are you not going to get away with that, whereas I might get a fine 
you're going to find yourself separated from your family, separated from your community, separated from your job for weeks, maybe months. Uh, you may find yourself automatically detained, and if you're automatically t detained uh, without an attorney, the chances are overwhelming that suddenly you're going to find yourself uh, deported and removed from the country. Two minutes left. Um, even if all you did was go two miles over the speed limit. So uh, what my research is getting at, and which is um, supported by a lot of the initiatives coming out of the Trump administration since uh, uh, the week after the inauguration in January, is that you have this two tiers that are being deepened into the national discourse, one for citizens and the other for immigrants. Um, very, very briefly, um, when we're talking about exclusions, the Trump administration tried to get to the low-hanging fruit very, very early on. They tried to get to the low-hanging fruit dealing with exclusion with the travel ban and with the wall. The fascinating thing here is that when you're talking about questions of exclusion, the federal government's power is at its apex in almost any field of law, and the amount of rights that an individual can hold on to and claim as their own are almost non-existent. So when you have a battle or a struggle between the government and an individual at a port of entry before the individual gains, crosses into the, the gateway of the United States where the Constitution kind of clicks in, the government all, all, almost always wins. And this is where the Trump administration, I think, strategically started um, um, in terms of the travel ban and the wall. The interesting thing is that was not expected by a lot of people, including myself, is the idea of se separation of powers and checks and balances have kicked in here and in a way that many of us never really thought. Example, very, very quickly. Um, uh, we're talking about the wall. The wall would be a 2,000 mile wall. It'll be between 50 and 55 feet high. Um, uh, and it'll cost anywhere between 24 and 40 billion, uh, 40 billion dollars. Okay. And it's not gonna work. They can't do it physically. It's untenable. Economically, it's gonna divide. It, 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 Go ahead. <laughs> I told my research assistant I am going to go over it and I didn't mean to. But anyway. um, the point being is that it wouldn't work, but he was going to do it anyway. I even heard on an NPR coming in this morning that they're taking bids. The thing is, is that if you go to Congress and you talk to members of Congress, their constituents overwhelmingly are coming to town hall meetings saying, there's absolutely no way that we want you to support, the, that we want you to support this legislation. And it looks as of today, and I would almost put money on it, that there will be no border wall. Congress wins, Congress is gonna place a check on the executive authority that's never been stronger at the border in terms of the border wall. In terms of travel bans, rather than looking at Congress as providing this check on executive power, the fascinating thing is that it's the courts. And when you're talking about immigration law, the courts overwhelmingly, when you're talking about exclusion, tends to defer to the power of the legislative and the executive branches. Here we have uh, two versions of the travel ban that were put in. The Ninth Circuit uh, uh, ruled against the Trump administration uh, on procedural grounds, not on substantive grounds. The Ninth Circuit is about to get this case. There's going to be oral arguments. On May, on, on May 15th, we should all listen to it, uh, based, upon the, uh, uh, based upon the establishment clause, it's based upon the idea of banning people from six majority uh, uh, Muslim countries uh, uh, in, in the Middle East area. Um, and it looks like, even though the president's authority, based upon the, this concept of plenary powers, is going to be knocked down by the federal courts uh, in a way that I find very, very surprising. So the bottom line here is that even though uh, there's a lot to complain about and to be afraid of with um, uh, uh, the new administration's approach to immigration, um, there are some things to celebrate, there are some good news, Congress, is, the powers of Congress is working, and as I just discussed, the powers of the courts are as well. So thank you very much. We have uh, the next uh, two uh, speakers are uh, Ronald Luna and uh, Christina Getrich. Uh, Ronald Luna received his uh, PhD in Geography from the University of Maryland and is lecturer in the Department of Geographical Studies and the department's undergraduate director. Uh, he teaches courses on developing countries, Latin American migration, and the geography of Latin America, and he's won uh, teaching awards. Uh, his research interests include Latin American migration, transnationalism, the creation of cultural spaces by immigrants and Latino communities in the United States. 
Uh, in the summer of 2015, he started an academic achievement soccer program at the University of Maryland to help prepare minority students for success at the university. Uh, Christina Gettridge is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. Her research uh, examines Latino health disparities and the incorporation of mixed immigration status families into US society. Uh, she explores the lived and embodied experiences of immigration policies and enforcement practices in order to determine how Latino immigrants, their children, and advocates maneuver to fight for broader social inclusion. Uh, her newest project explores the health and well-being of deferred action for childhood arrivals recipients in Maryland. She is leading a team of UM uh, uh, University graduate and undergraduate anthropology students to determine how this population's access to health, uh, to care, health conditions, and overall well-being have changed as a result of uh, DACA. So, uh, model first. So I'll start by thanking uh, Lily for inviting me, uh, also for the other individuals that created this program. So I'm very honored to be among so many scholars. Uh, I won't talk about my research. I chose many years ago not to do research for various reasons, but what I do is more on the personal side. I'll start by telling my story. So before uh, Dreamers, there was me in 1986. My family and I came undocumented to the United States. Uh, then in 1994, uh, there was not necessarily any programs, special programs at the University of Maryland that would allow undocumented to come in, but there was a loophole in the system that said that if your parents had or were in the process of getting a green card, then they would extend some type of uh, temporary status to you. And that's how I actually eventually made it to the University of Maryland. So Lily and Pat kind of knew me back then. Uh, but this whole idea about immigration and deportation for a lot of you is new. For me, it has been kind of like part of my entire life, right? So. Uh, this fear, right? This constant uh, kind of like worrying about what's happening and checking the news and the media plays a lot with this fear among the immigrant community, uh, which is sad to this extent, but it's real, right? I remember trying to go to the soccer field, which I did every single day, and my mom would say, don't go because you're gonna get deported. I said, mom, by the time they get me, you know, I'll be running the hill somewhere, right? But it was this constant fear uh, living in the immigrant community. So, you know, there are individuals that do the research and kind of like put that uh, context to it. For me, it's more about a personal story. And one of the things that I've been trying to do here on campus uh, is try to um, kind of like tell my story. You know, sometimes individuals are very shy about where they come from. I'm, I'm not necessarily very shy about my origins. And then also try to motivate other individuals to go out and make a difference. So um, a lot of the stuff that I've done in my academic uh, life here on campus has been not necessarily trying to talk about it. Uh, I try to bypass that and try to do things. So uh, when I was in college, uh, I was, I think, 18, 19, I actually started an academic program uh, in Langley Park. At that time, there was no soccer programs in the area. Uh, and we had 186 kids, uh, four leagues, uh, 16 divisions. Uh, 32 coaches, and one of the things that I learned about that period of mine was that there, there is a carrot, and many for the Hispanic community is soccer. Unfortunately, when we decided to flip the program and to make it what I eventually wanted to do, which was more in the academic and the mentoring, we went from 186 kids to only six kids. And then what you begin to realize is that, uh, to me, uh, you know, we left it, uh, I did that for four years, I kind of burned myself out in the process and I went on and did my master's and my PhD. And then two years ago, my friend at that time that we did the program back in uh, almost 17 years ago, we realized something very interesting that even though at that moment we felt burned out and we felt unappreciated and we felt that the parents were using us as free babysitting, uh, we realized that many of those kids eventually made it to University of Maryland and graduated. So I used to see them as my students in my class and I used to see them in graduation. But there was no way to quantify that uh, unless, you know, those individual stories. And it made us think about this opportunity that what would have happened if we continued for 17 more years, how many more students would we have been able to get them into college? So a couple years ago, uh, even though life has been crazy for me, uh, my friend says, are you interested in starting up again? I said, I don't know, right? What's the commitment involved? He said, well, you know, let's try the summer, see how it goes. And then, you know, people that know me, I try to live a very stress-free life. And, um, not, it's not stress-free when you have, you know, 86 kids uh, from kindergarten to sixth grade uh, running around campus uncontrolled, right? So trying to manage that energy has been extremely interesting. But once again, as a practitioner, and once you begin to understand that there's stories to be told, 
One of the things that I learned, once again, that I knew this because I've been teaching for a while here on campus, is that unfortunately, the Hispanic community and the Latino community has severe issues. Um, and I don't know where it starts, I don't know how it ends, I don't know how you fix it, but it's pandemic. I mean, we were spending time at the local elementary schools where they were spending millions of dollars trying to get these kids educated. And we were spending time with kids in kindergartens that couldn't read. In first grade, they couldn't do simple word association. In third grade, they couldn't do multiplication tables. And they're, they're spending millions of dollars trying to get this through. And then you see them on campus, and there are severe issues with Hispanic uh, communities and minority students trying to get them to graduate, retention rates, not even talking about them getting to graduate school. So one of the things I've been trying to do is how do you solve that kind of stuff, and how do you begin to motivate individuals, not at the high school level, not at the uh, college level, but how do you motivate kids at the kindergarten level to begin to think about uh, college? And that's how we eventually started this program that I have, and thank for the anthropology department, Eric, and the other individuals for supporting us. Uh, it's crazy, I know, uh, but it's worthwhile. And you get two reactions when you have kids on campus, and I learned that firsthand. One, people rejoice about hearing the kids laughing, or laughing, or you know, running around. And the other one is, you get uh, called the police upon you because these kids are making noise on the mall, right? Which happened to us a lot, right? So I asked the police officer, and I said, you know, can they actually do something about, you know, can they actually like detain us by, you know, having this kids on campus? He said, no, this is a public space. You're welcome to come, and if you get, you know, if you get threatened, just give me a call, and we'll try to solve it. But it's very interesting, right, that kids should be the reason why we do a lot of this stuff, right? Try to educate and try to encourage them, trying to promote them. But then you have in campus, in certain cases, that is not welcome to individuals. Now, you have these special programs like, you know, I'm not going to talk about the athletic department too much because I don't have any film and I have their journalists, right? But when you see these camps, right, where they have like the football teams and the basketball teams, and it's very interesting because we see them every morning. They all look very alike. There is no diversity, right, because it's economic costs associated with it. So many minorities cannot afford to come on campus for the summer camps that cost thousands and thousands of dollars and experience what we should all be allowing to experience, which is the opportunity about higher education. So higher education to me is this very passionate component because I've seen it with a lot of the students. Higher education is moving away and away from the middle class. The lower class has no options. There's very little option to get. So I always tell students that if I would have been applying to the University of Maryland today in 2017, I would not have been accepted to the University of Maryland. What does that say, right? So that's something that we need to think about diversity. I think we need to think about uh, some of the mechanisms that we use to attract individuals to campus, right? And what is diversity? Which I have a big problem with it, uh, but I won't get into it right now. But once again, it's just food for thought. Uh, and hopefully, I see a lot of young people, which is a very encouraging to me. Uh, so hopefully, you can make the difference uh, because we are getting older and we need to be replaced, right? No, I'm just kidding. So I'm too late. And can you all hear me? I didn't ruin the noise, did I? Um, okay, so you all were being an anthropologists in a sense with the empathy exercise that you started with, talking to each other, listening to each other, and telling each other stories. Um, so that's a lot of what we do in anthropology. Um, but what we're trying, what we do, the way that we approach immigration is by trying to understand these larger processes and structures, um, but how they intersect with people's everyday lives on the ground. Um, so that's really the objective of, of what we're trying to do in anthropology. So today I'll be speaking about my current research project, um, which is on DACA recipients living in Maryland, um, that I'm currently working on with graduate and undergraduate students in anthropology. And I want to give a quick shout out to two of them, Delmas Umansor and Ume Habiba, um, who have worked hard on this project. Um, but to start off, I suppose it's appropriate that I provide some background on DACA. Um, a lot of people, when I say what I'm working on, um, aren't sure what DACA refers to. So I'll give you a bit of background. Um, so DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, it was an executive order passed by former President Obama in June 2012 um, to really address the situation of dreamers, sort of the dreamers that Ron was talking about. 
Um, so people who came uh, as children either came undocumented or lost their status somewhere along the way. Um, so it was a temporary sort of stopgap measure for these dreamers in order to give them some security and form of status. Uh, but what's important to know is that it's a temporary form of status. Um, so they have to renew it every two years. It costs, I think, almost up to $500 in order to do so. Um, so their expenses, and they go through this very comprehensive application process in order to get this um, temporary form of status. Um, the other part of it, um, along with work authorization, which is one of the big things, is that it gives them deferral from deportation. Um, so they can, theoretically anyway, um, be safer in, in working and, and living their lives. So as of September 2016, uh, 11,108 young adults in Maryland, so taking it really local here, in Maryland um, had applied for DACA. Um, and this is a Migration Policy Institute, actually has a really great resource where you can see state by state and even county by county uh, the number of DACA recipients. So I, I direct you to that as, as one good resource. Um, the top countries of origin of our state DACA eligible population are El Salvador, Mexico, Guatemala, and Korea um, is, is the fourth. Um, Montgomery and Prince George's counties have the highest concentration of DACA eligible populations in the state um, with Baltimore um, behind them. Um, and so our project really focused on Prince George's and Montgomery counties, so our, our local and nearby um, communities. So in terms of the present moment, the future of DACA um, and the more than 750,000 young adults who have it, who've benefited from it, um, is uncertain. Uh, as a candidate, Donald Trump um, vowed repeatedly uh, to get rid of the program, and because it's an executive order, um, he can undo it very easily. Um, but so far that hasn't happened, uh, but some of what, happened, what has happened is that some DACA recipients have been detained. Um, and so there are questions about how secure um, this deferral of, of deportation really is for them. Um, so this is evolving, right, the, the state of DACA, what's going to happen to DACA. Um, and so um, beyond, uh, I guess, the, the couple of cases of, of detentions that we've seen so far, um, the government has all of their information, right? They had to go through this comprehensive application process. Um, so the government has pictures, fingerprints, addresses. Um, so uh, there's really great concern that they could use that to target those individuals. Um, so our project uh, actually took place before the election, mostly before the election. Um, and we did our interviews um, mostly over the summer last year, um, but the election certainly was looming large, right, and was something that we discussed. Um, it was in our interview guide, but it was also something that people brought up sort of on their own anyway. Um, so we conducted interviews and surveys. Um, it was me and then one of the students, so we went around in pairs conducting interviews and surveys with DACA recipients. Um, and our um, participants were um, sort of interesting in composition. We had 30, as I mentioned. Um, 25 out of the 30 were Latino, although they were from very different countries of origin. So we have a, a, a you know, good representation of, of Mexico, Central America, and South America. Um, but I also want to highlight, we had three who were from Asian countries and two who were from African countries. And they reported feeling really much, very much on the sidelines. Um, or on the margins, um, they described it, of, of the broader immigrant rights movement. Um, so I think in, in our representation of, of this work, and in general, it's important to think about the, the wide range of people who may fall under the category of, of something like DACA. Um, so we want to honor that, certainly. Um, so in addition to um, their countries of origins, we had um, uh, they were a median age of 22 at the time of the interview. Um, they had arrived um, at median age of eight here to the United States. Um, they were more female than male. Um, men are harder to get um, in general, I think we find often in our studies. Um, and uh, 27 were enrolled, uh, currently enrolled in college. Uh, 11 or 37% of them were students here at University of Maryland. Um, so uh, very local in some senses. So what did we find? Um, as other scholars have found, we saw clearly the gains that DACA provided in, in higher educational attainment, um, getting better paying and more satisfying jobs, um, as well as improving conditions of everyday life, including getting credit cards, bank accounts, as well as driver's licenses. Uh, we also found that DACA impacted participants' mental health positively. 
Uh, as one male participant asserted, if I had to boil it down, DACA gives me security wherever I am. And in fact, this is the, the term and the concept that they used to talk about their mental health quite a bit was that of security or insecurity on the flip side. Um, DACA also provided them with a boost in self-esteem, optimism, confidence, those are their terms. Um, another male participant also noted, when I first got the actual card, I remember thinking, now I can belong in society. Because before it was literally like I didn't belong. Um, so we see tremendous benefits. Um, but despite these gains in security, self-esteem, and belonging, uh, we found that their anxiety and fear lingered. Um, in part due to concerns about the election as well as the temporariness of the program. Um, so one female participant noted, I don't think there's ever going to be a time when my anxiety is resolved. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of people were visibly anxious um, as we were conducting these interviews. So participants' anxiety had increased in part due to the local um, uptick in enforcement activities that uh, had, was starting to take place in January 2016. A lot of people talked about that. Uh, we, one male participant talked about uh, these enforcement uh, raids as being urban legend in Maryland previously, but they came um, with a new prominence right, um, in, in this period. Um, and so for this individual himself, this urban legend came to pass one Sunday as his mom went to the grocery store to get some food and came home empty-handed. Um, and so he went in his mother's place, ultimately, proactively pulled out his documents to show the enforcement agents. Um, but this underscores how security is experienced within family members or family units whose members hold different immigration status. Okay, I'm going to start talking faster. Um, <laughs> so um, we want to think about then um, this unit of the mixed status family, right, where people who are citizens or have different statuses um, are really affected by these enforcement activities nonetheless. Um, what's striking to me is somebody who's spent uh, 15 plus years working in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands on border enforcement issues um, is how much of that I see here now in Maryland, and I'm, I'm a native Marylander myself, um, so this is different um, for our area and, and certainly not a good development. Um, so uh, immigrant communities are, are currently under duress, certainly, here in Maryland, um, continuing throughout the country to the border, um, where I've, I've spent a lot of time. Um, and so I would urge us to, to think through the implications of, of these immigration policies and um, really executive orders um, that we're now seeing um, taking place, um, the impact on families and communities. Um, but I also want to underscore that we see great resilience um, in immigrant communities, and among youth in particular. Uh, and this is numerous, uh, evident in numerous public campaigns like Here to Stay, hashtag Here to Stay, and hashtag Save DACA. Um, we see it here on campus, uh, right? Uh, our, our students have been uh, really at the forefront of, in getting an undocumented student coordinator here on campus of organizing protests. Um, so we need to see our students as a resource. Um, and uh, I guess in the aftermath of the election too, I think a lot of people are, are interested in how they can participate and um, what's going on, how can I plug into things. So I wanted to mention just, um, I, I promise I'm concluding here, um, a, a couple of things going on on campus. Um, so if students are interested, I see a lot of students here today, which is wonderful. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, um, there's an UndocuTurb student ally training on Wednesday, April 12th from 5.30 to 7.30 in Stamp. It's part of um, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, so that would be a great opportunity for you to go if you would like to, to learn how to be a better ally. And I'll also call everybody's attention um, to our new website, undocumented.umd.edu, um, which also has training sessions available for staff and faculty. Um, and you can, you can follow the link there and, and find resources. Um, and if you yourself are a student in this situation and need resources, that is obviously an excellent um, resource page for you. Um, and I, I just finally, um, I, I think it's really important to have these interdisciplinary kinds of dialogues as well where we can learn about sort of the bigger picture, um, sort of structural um, circumstances, but also um, the stories and personal experiences um, that, that people have within those larger structures. So thank you. Judith Friedenberg and uh, Susan Doherty. Uh, Judith Friedenberg is a uh, professor of anthropology uh, and has worked for many years uh, with the immigrant population at Langley Park. Uh, in 2000, she established the Immigrant Life Course Research Program, whose purpose is to 
better understand the effects and outcomes of the flow of immigrants to the state of Maryland. Um, the research team includes undergraduates and graduate students from a um, variety of departments. Uh, some of her findings, uh, research, are reported in her recent book, Contemporary Conversations on Immigration in the United States, The View from Prince George's County, uh, which was published last year. Um, today she will be talking about, I understand, immigration from the United States. Okay. And our uh, last speaker is Susan Doherty, who is Director of International Students and Scholar Services on Campus. Uh, she is responsible for programs and policies for the more than uh, 7,000 international students, scholars, faculty, and staff at the university. That's kind of a large number. Um, she has recently been especially busy providing resources and advice on how to deal with the executive orders on border security and immigration. So, Judith. I also want to start by thanking Lily. Uh, this would not have happened without her. I also want to follow on uh, Ronald's footsteps and uh, start by a personal uh, story. Um, I uh, was born and raised in Argentina. My parents were also born and raised there. My grandparents came from Eastern Europe. And um, I um, became naturalized as a US citizen in 1985. Um, and um, I've done, as uh, Eric said, um, a lot of research um, on immigration to the United States, primarily focusing on Prince George's County. But now I'm um, placing uh, my research eyes and my activist eyes on the other side of the coin, that is on immigration from the United States. Uh, this is a topic that I will continue uh, researching uh, across the American Unis uh, hemisphere uh, for the next few years as I retire from uh, the University of Maryland and try to contribute to increase uh, or ease a north-south uh, uh, global dialogue. So I'd like to, uh, so I'm moving from a local to an international lens on the national conversation and immigration. And um, I think that you know, to provide a context for this, um, I start by thinking on how we think about migration. That is um, how we frame the foreign born to define what the nation is. Um, typically, and particularly now, um, immigration, so all of us foreign born, as framed or thought of as social problems. Um, the issue has become, of course, more and more contentious, but it's not certainly the first time in U.S. history that this has happened in 8082, uh, the, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed and it was only repealed in 1943. And actually some of Trump's language um, attempts to emulate uh, that exclusionary policy. Um, and um, do remember that in his meeting with Chancellor Merkel, Trump um, expressed that immigration is a privilege, not a right. And I say this um, uh, because um, I think that um, this labeling uh, finger, uh, points a finger on all of us. I mean, although I don't think Mr. Trump thinks of somebody like me when he talks about immigrants, um, and, you know, we're all, you know, all of us foreign born are immigrants. So, um, um, also, I want to uh, contextualize um, what I'm about to say by um, pointing to data from the International Office for Migration, which points out that if, despite all of the noise that we make in the world about migration, only 3% of the total world population is residing away from the country of birth. Um, migration flows tend, uh, have tended to be from south to north, from more developing to more developed countries, but um, there is an increase in south to south migration and a beginning of north to south migration. And that is where I, I um, uh, 
contextualize um, the question, do people only immigrate to the United States? We only talk about immigration, but um, uh, in spite of theories of American exceptionalism, uh, Americans also immigrate. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. state only uh, accounts for uh, those living abroad who work for the government, like the diplomatic service and the military. Uh, and there's only estimates about uh, U.S. nationals living abroad, but there are very good um, non-governmental associations of the foreign born who are U.S. nationals abroad, and their estimates range from six to 10 million people. We do know that there is about a million and a half uh, U.S. nationals living in Mexico, and uh, about the same living in Canada, but um, the uh, uh, U.S. nationals have been leaving the United States, not only as in the decades of the 30s to the 50s to Paris and London, but they've been moving south um, throughout the American hemisphere, and they've uh, moved as far as Argentina, which is my country of birth, but um, which is the southernmost country in the American hemisphere, so you would think that people wouldn't move that far, but according to the U.S. Embassy in Argentina, there are about 100,000 U.S. nationals living in uh, Argentina. Um, of course, they are pretty invisible to the Argentines because they tend to be white and middle class. A lot of them are undocumented. They uh, just pay a fine upon leaving if they forget to cross over to the neighboring country, Uruguay, to stamp their U.S. passports again for another three months. Um, of course, they pass in Argentina, which immigration uh, from uh, Bolivia and Paraguay uh, cannot, cannot afford. Um, but the fact is that they face the same issues that immigrants coming to the United States, um, you know, as, you know, othering, you know, do they accept me? Will they understand my language? Where can I find peanut butter? <laughs> and <laughs> things like that. So um, what I, I think to wrap up, I'm bringing here is that mobility is normal has historically been universal since um, Homo sapiens sapiens uh, developed in the, in the world and that uh, there is no reason to make it exceptional. We all move. Thank you. That I bring that I bring to the meeting today um, is really one of a practitioner. Um, everyone else here is conducting research, um, and uh, what I do for the university is to work with its faculty and scholars that are coming in for research and teaching purposes, as well as work with the students that we have here. Uh, in degree-seeking programs and cultural exchanges. Um, I want to remind us all in the room that uh, Donald Trump took the oath of office for the presidency on January 20th of 2017. And from that date, we have experienced much change. Much change in the field of immigration, and it's been very fast moving. Um, we are fortunate for the courts, and um, in my personal opinion, <laughs> and um, I am quite uh, happy to see our government functioning in the way that it has been recently. I think that it's doing its job, and um, it is helping me to do my job as well. <laughs> um, some of the shifts that I have seen uh, since 
the executive orders have been being signed and rescinded and having temporary restraining orders placed on them uh, have been previously when I did my job here at the university and I still do it in this way is I've been interacting with the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service, which is the service arm of the Department of Homeland Security. This is where people who are here on immigration statuses um, apply to immigration for benefits. So maybe they need their employment authorization or perhaps um, they need to change from one immigration status to another. Um, this is the type of work that in my office that we're used to performing for the researchers, scholars, and students at the university. We also have an aspect of our work because we are working with um, two immigration statuses for students, the F-1 visa and the J-1 visa, which are part of a Department of Homeland Security database uh, where we have a compliance function that we fulfill in helping our students maintain their status uh, while they're here studying. And so in that function, we're interacting with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement side of the Department of Homeland Security. That, uh, that agency within the Department of Homeland Security is the operator of that database. And um, we're working with that database in ensuring compliance for the students who are here studying. The final area of the Department of Homeland Security that affects people who come into this country is um, Customs and Border Protection. And those are the people that when you're entering or crossing a border and you're coming through a port of entry to the United States, you're going to interact with an agent who is from Customs and Border Protection. They're reviewing people with documents. They're looking at the documents and they are um, determining the status that you will receive once you are inside the U.S. borders. Um, and that's another part where we will work with the Customs and Border Protection agents. If somebody may have been given incorrect status on entry to the U.S., then we'll help our, uh, the person receive the proper status. Um, I think what I can bring today to this conversation is the idea of our system of immigration, and it has many statuses. Each immigration status is given an alphabetic uh, letter, and that letter has a primary purpose from my perspective. And what we're doing is to help people to understand the purpose of the status that they've been admitted to this country. And I also recognize that when we work with a person, whether they are documented or undocumented, that we are working with a whole person. And they are not, their identity is uh, not equal to that status that they were given on entry to this country. And I think one of the conflicts that I have observed over the years in working with uh, the immigrant community is that that status and the goals and objectives that an individual has while they're here in the United States can uh, come into conflict with one another as someone's goals and objectives change. And that's where when we're working through the process with the United States uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service, where we can possibly assist someone with achieving that changing objective. Um, and for a person who is uh, having to go through all these petitions and applications and paperwork, it can be a frustrating and challenging process. And um, I will personalize that because just recently uh, I decided that I would try to um, get myself an Irish passport. And um, <laughs> I. I'm the daughter of uh, grandparents who immigrated from Ireland, and the steps that I have to go through to accomplish an Irish passport are taking me, um, going on close to a year of trying to accomplish this. One of the first hurdles I have to overcome is to get myself registered as a foreign-born Irish national. <laughs> and so 
Um, these are the types of challenges. It's really personalized for me when someone is uh, coming to the university or coming to the United States um, and they have changes and their goals that they want to achieve that um, these new hurdles always present themselves with a very large challenge and it takes a lot of perseverance and patience to make it past um, all the bureaucracy and the paperwork challenges that people have. It hasn't been an easy time on this campus. Um, we have a large community. The anxiety level in our community has certainly gone up. We have had programs like this one, which I think have been uh, presented to the community to create knowledge and understanding. Uh, we've had other programs that have run on campus that also are here trying to lower the anxiety level. And we will continue to have these types of programs uh, throughout the year. Um, so I hope we have time for questions. Um, and I'm sorry I couldn't quite get into the depth that I was hoping to with you all, but I am available if you want to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all six very uh, interesting and different uh, presentations. And now we do have some time for questions and discussions. Um, please speak into the microphone that, uh, that uh, Kelsey is going to pass around. So who has a question? Who has a very important discussion over here? Uh, hello. So in response to Dr. Kulish's comments about the uh, Congress being against the wall and the courts being against the travel ban, do you think that the Trump administration, the same way it's framing the story of immigration, is in itself framing a story about government being entirely against uh, immigrants themselves. Like, do you see that as a double face, uh, double sided face? <clears throat> well, um, I think that's a good question. So, let me um, temper my remarks now that I can go into more detail. <laughs> One, it's still going through the courts. We have no idea what. It'll probably go up to the Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit, however they decide, it'll probably go up to the Supreme Court. Um, just today, they, they just announced the nuclear option, so we're gonna have a Justice Gorsuch added to the Supreme Court. It's gonna be potentially a 5-4 decision. We don't know how, I, I, I couldn't tell you how the court is eventually going to uh, uh, rule on that. Uh, we, if you wanna talk more, I'd be happy to tell you what I think. Uh, as for Congress too, um, it appears highly unlikely that they will put out the money because the money is about 10 times as much as that which the executive proposal of its budget um, estimated. And, and so the, the real funds look so astronomical that it's, I think it's very, high, high, uh, very unlikely that, that the House will uh, uh, vote to authorize these funds. So in my mind, that's a non-starter. I think it was already always designed for that purpose, and I think it was designed more as a symbolic effort, um, which is part of a larger game that I think the administration is playing based upon sovereignty and, and drumming up uh, what we see as part of a larger current of ethno-nationalism, uh, and immigration is a great tool in order to advance that larger argument that's being advanced. At the same time, I think the president, uh, rather than looking at it in terms of the government, um, he's using this as a way to try to augment his authority. Uh, and, and so I would look at it that way. There's a lot of signs of, of uh, kind of anti-democratic movements within the uh, administration. Immigration has always been a canary in the coal mine because presidential and congressional powers are at its greatest uh, when we're dealing with immigrants, particularly at the borders, and I think it's being used as as kind of an experiment right now to see how far um, the administration can go. If they win, I think some of these strategies uh, move on into domestic policy and in other areas. Okay. Who, else, who else has a question over here? Hi, um, I am a first year student in the school counseling program here as well as the assistant director for science discovery in the university and college park scholars um, living learning program for first and second year students here um, and so my question is what do you believe are the best ways to support and program for um, students especially undocumented students in k-12 through education um, as well as those in a college
college setting. Sure. Um, so I think there's various ways. I think uh, one of the things that I learned is you have to engage the parents. So if the parents are afraid then the children are not necessarily going to be very active, right? So, uh, and that is very difficult. Uh, once again, there is this, I will say, stereotypes and uh, maybe for better or for worse that Hispanic parents are not engaging or, you know, not engaged as much as other parents. But there has to be something else that you have to kind of like win their trust and kind of connect with them. So how do you do that? I think that's a problem, even though we have a program that we try to educate their, their children. Uh, you know, the parents, some, sometimes it's very hard to connect with them, even though I speak their language, I have a story to tell. So uh, it's, it's almost like educating the, the parents as well. So I think it starts with the parents and then making the school officials also welcoming to those parents that not necessarily know the language. Um, I've been around uh, different schools where they actually have an entire staff where they have a parent liaison where they speak Spanish and she's calling and she's trying to coordinate but then the parents are not responsive. So you can't blame everything just on the education side or the structure. The parents themselves have to be proactive. So but once again, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a murky kind of situation because sometimes the parents don't trust or, or the background where they come from might not necessarily make them trust the environment or the system. But it's just something that you have to constantly be gaining the trust, connect with the parents and win their trust, and sometimes engage them. And that is something that I have failed in my program that I have. We have the parents that are kept captive audience for two, audi uh, two hours, but I don't have the time or the mechanisms to teach them about stuff. So that's something that I would like for other individuals to come in and maybe do like an immigration forum or, you know, know the rights or something like that. So uh, I guess that's a plug for my program. So. <laughs> I think here on campus, it's important, you know, that we've just committed to having this undocumented student coordinator position, which is fabulous. Um, but there's just so many everyday things that are hard for students who are undocumented or documented. Um, just as a quick example, they get, every semester it happens where they're, they're reclassified as a foreign student. Um, so they have to sort of take on that bureaucracy to figure out how to change their status and that sort of thing. Um, and so having those resources, having people that can help them, you know, sort of minimize the impact of having to do that again and again. But also creating a space uh, where people, you know, a lot of the people that, that we interviewed uh, talked about sort of even having some form of status with DACA, still not being comfortable talking to friends and other people about it. Um, and so I think people were really, I'm trying to seek a connection with other people, so having these kinds of spaces where people can connect, you know, with people who are in the same status, but also promote situations where people have broader understanding of their limitations. Um, and that's how they put it, too. You know, they talk about the limitations, but they also talk about the workarounds. We had this one um, participant who had this great concept of this workaround. There's always a work workaround for everything I've found in my life, he said. Um, so just, you know, con connectivity in terms of, um, not feeling alone, but also sharing some of these workaround strategies, I think is really important. One other thing, I, I, I too would um, give a shout out to the incredible work that students in Plumas are doing and, and in um, a lot of other student organizations who, who have come together on the issue of undocumented immigration, working with DACA students and dream, dreamers in, 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 in Maryland. I think the key thing yeah, I don't think that there is an answer, and I think that, uh, but we have to keep trying. The only two things that I come up with is uh, um, having as many Know Your Rights sessions as possible, uh, bringing in attorneys on campus that can um, work with undocumented students and provide confidential consultations with them. Uh, um, there are undocumented uh, students, both here and elsewhere, that actually are eligible for legal status and they just don't know it. And, and so there is a need for uh, bringing in attorneys. Um, we, 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 we have done this, um, we're doing this in, in kind of collaboration with some of the other universities in the greater DC area. And um, I think this is part of what's going on on campus. I think that's very important. The only other thing I would say is whether you call it sanctuary or, or anything else, it's incredibly important for people in the highest positions of power on this campus uh, to continue to speak out uh, 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 about the need to protect uh, our uh, undocumented student population and that the university um, 
has a role to play, which is to educate and not to be uh, by proxy enforcement officers and by cooperating with people that would um, cut short um, many of our students' uh, uh, education and their educational potential. But it's tough. Yeah. I, I would just add that um, working with the uh, office that has recently been established for the undocumented students um, and the International Student Scholar Services to provide clarity and understanding under the roles of the offices, the role the university has, and the protections that are being offered to people on campus uh, so, that they're, uh, so that we build the trust that was mentioned earlier. And I think the university is doing a lot to build that trust, but there's a lot of misunderstanding. And maybe some of the programming that we could offer would be to start to build a better understanding of what the university is trying to do. Can, can anyone comment on what the university is doing with respect to students coming from overseas, and in particular from, let us say, the third world countries who are applying or have applied to enter the university next year, but who are very much concerned about whether they will or will not be in trouble because of the Trump administration? Well, um, what we've decided to do with our admissions process, and uh, the university always takes the position where we're admitting uh, an individual based on their academic eligibility for, their, uh, for admission. Um, after that decision has been made by the university, then uh, the students who may require documents to come and study at the university are uh, sent to my office and we begin to do our outreach uh, to that population to ask if they are asking us for any immigration documents uh, to use to enter the United States. Um, right at this time, there's no special communication that, are, that is going out to uh, groups of students, but we are working with students who may write to us or email us individually with their specific questions. We have, st we have uh, we, we're thinking about going to 215 if we continue to have questions, so discussion, yes. Hi, um, my question has to do with established immigrant communities in the area. Um, I'm a journalism student, and I've been looking at um, particularly um, the Ethiopian community in Silver Spring in DC, and um, the impact that they've had, in particular with restaurants, um, on like the business, business and economic side of the community. And I'm just sort of wondering, um, for communities that do have sort of made that mark and have established themselves in some way in certain areas, um, given the recent political turns of events, do you think that that is a kind of, offers some security in a way, or do you think that's been threatened in some sense? I just wonder if you could speak on that. Um, I think with the stronger the community, especially I can only speak about the Salvadoran community in the Washington DC area, there's different levels. You have individuals like myself that don't fear, you know, uh, then you have another individuals that might be in the process and you have the new individuals that are coming through. The stronger the community it is, it provides certain protection to a certain extent, provides a networking, provides uh, certain outlets, it provides a sense of community. Now, if the larger community is immigrant, uh, undocumented, then that creates a shift, right? So uh, most immigrant communities, if they're being threatened, like it happened in 2008, 2010 with, uh, with Prince William County, uh, Frederick County and Washington County, uh, Loudoun County passing extremely uh, anti-immigration laws, people just left. They went to other counties. So you, you have to examine uh, what is the impact based upon the, the status of the immigrant community and how they're being threatened. But if you're documented, which in most cases in many communities that you have, will have a large percentage of individuals, so the Durham community has been here since the 1970s, so, and there's an influx in the 1986, and the 92, and 98, and 2002, and 2012. So it really depends what you're talking about in terms of 
the threat, right? So uh, I can definitely see with individuals that recently have come, you know, they're, they're sending extra money down to Honduras because they might get deported. You know, so there's that fear factor there, but once again, it depends on the status. What else? Who else has a question? Yes? Yeah. Uh, We're trying to record this. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so my question is regarding sort of terrorism, and one of the issues that I was thinking about um, is two things. First, you talked about like how terrorism, its impact on the United States, or its intended impact on the developed world. But I think one of my questions in the first place is always, how do you, particularly in your database, define a terrorist act because it's such a blurred line between like general criminal activity and terrorist activity? And then secondly, one of the issues that I know we were talking about a lot before immigration as a whole, but relates to immigration, was this idea of terrorist activity as a instigator for immigration, either towards the terrorist activity or where the or away from the terrorist activity. So if you could speak to those two things, I would greatly appreciate it. Sure, those are um, questions with very long answers. <laughs> uh, so to your first question about how we define terrorism, uh, very carefully, uh, we have extensive inclusion criteria for what types of violent attacks uh, will be included, the short version of our definition of terrorism is it's the threatened or actual use of illegal force or violence to attain a political, social, economic, or religious goal through fear, coercion, or intimidation. We break all that down into like a list of criteria and we assess that against every report of uh, a violent attack that we, that we come across in the media. It's all based on open source uh, activity. Uh, a lot of, in a lot of cases, there's no agreed upon definition of terrorism. Um, ours is somewhat broader than, than others. It does, it, it sort of butts up against insurgency and war and uh, the actors that are involved are often involved in various types of, of uh, violence and conflict. Uh, in uh, Western democracies like the United States, there's often overlap between terrorist attacks and hate crime that we have to have sort of particular criteria to differentiate between. Uh, all of this is documented in our lengthy code book that you're welcome to check out on uh, the, the website. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a short answer to that. Um, but it's a, it's a very good point. Um, and our, our goal is to make the database as transparent as possible and as flexible as possible so that people who approach it uh, can see the information that they're looking at and why an event was included or not included. Uh, to your second question about sort of terrorism being the cause of uh, immigration, right? Uh, I think that's a really great point, actually. And so in popular discourse, a lot of the uh, sort of uh, support for, for example, a travel ban will say, well, you know, we're worried about uh, terrorists coming into the country. In fact, that's what the executive order was called, like terrorist exclusion something, something. Um, and while in theory, in the abstract, that that's not impossible, right? You know, you, there, no one's going to stand here and say that's impossible. Um, but the the iron the ironic part of it is that many, you know, and especially when you're talking about refugee populations, they are trying to get away from that. Um, so if you're worried about people suffering from terrorism, uh, you know, restricting refugee entry and and, and immigrant entry. Um, makes no sense whatsoever. It's it's really uh, it's really concerning that that you're taking some of the the populations that are most vulnerable to terrorism, uh, and uh, and sort of making it difficult for them to, to actually escape. Meanwhile, you know, in, in terms of of terrorist organizations, you know, I think ISIL has said that they they intend to uh, exploit the refugee populations to to get perpetrators into the United States. Uh, I mean, if you study terrorism. Again, you'll say this, it's not, it's not strictly impossible, but it's like the worst way. It's like the most inefficient possible way uh, to achieve your goals. And the only goal that that would achieve is scaring people into thinking that you're going to do that. Right? You don't even you wouldn't have to do it, you just have to say that you're going to do that. 
And you have what I was talking about earlier about these second and third order effects where you know, policies are changed and, and values are compromised and, and you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot for a variety of other reasons, uh, despite the fact that it, it's literally like one of the worst possible ways. If, you, if you're planning a terrorist attack, it's just not really uh, a, a good strategy for accomplishing that, that initial goal. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, wait for that. Can I remember to close this? Uh, can that work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hold it. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, this this question isn't really towards immigration, but it's towards terrorism. Um, so we're now in the information age, to my knowledge. Um, so how do you feel? How successful are we in evolving to deal with the threats of cyber terrorism? Um, I guess that's the full question. Yeah. Uh, how successful are we? Not very successful. Um, yeah. So my my work doesn't really include a lot of of cyber terrorism. We include um, focus on physical uh, violence. If if cyber tactics were used to carry out uh, an attack, um, we would consider that for in inclusion to you know to carry out a violent like you know, derailing a train or something like that. Um, so cyber terrorism is sort of a whole separate area. Uh, and I do think it's a, a big concern. I mean, in terms of, of again, it, it's something that you can have, a fairly small action can have uh, much, much larger sort of reciprocal reactions uh, to that. And I, I do think it's, it's certainly uh, something that we're uh, not fully prepared to to really uh, defend against. One more question. We have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Anybody, we have one more question. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I think it's it's fair to say we're all uh, very much in agreement that uh, immigration is a good thing for the United States in this room, anyway. Uh, and we're looking for ways in which we can, you know make that go forward in spite of the current situation. Uh, what I wonder about is whether there's some sense that uh, of the other side of well, what, what, do, what do we need to do or think about with respect to immigration, where immigration might actually be a, an issue for society. You know, so um, some of the things that have come up are Oh, there's cultural norms that are threatened. Is there, is there any sense that there's a leg legitimacy to that, or that that could be ameliorated, or uh, is that just a flat out uh, hogwash? You know, just the opinion of you. I think yeah. it seems the question is uh, the, what are some of the negative consequences of immigration? Well, why do we have this huge? Backlash. We we don't have that backlash. What <laughs> in the society is a huge backlash? Is it complete? You know, where is that coming? From? I think if we look historically, we can see there's plenty of precedent for it, right. I mean, uh, Dr. Friedenberg talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act, you know, in 1882 or 1880, I believe it was. So I, th I think we have, you know, the, the group that's targeted has changed over time, but uh, I think it's a deeper question. You know, why do we do this again and again? And, and frankly, why don't we learn our lessons from previous rounds of, of history? Um, I mean, I think there's legitimate questions uh, to be raised about resource issues and, and things like that, but I think the problem is they get shrouded in a lot of rhetoric and a lot of, um, well, alternative facts, I guess you could say. Um, so, I, but it's, it's an interesting, I think if we take a historical look, we can see that, that we've been doing this again and again and again. I don't have a, a good answer for you necessarily. But. I would just add um, that you can't view, in, in my opinion, you can't view American history without viewing it through the lens of race. And, and we have a history of racism in this country. And I think with the history of racism comes a history of nativism and xenophobia. And it goes all the way back to the first settlers. It goes back to our founding fathers. Uh, ben, ben Franklin was one of the biggest uh, 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 nativists uh, of, of, of his day. And, and so there's um, deeply embedded and entrenched threads 
of, of, uh, of exclusion and of uh, 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 subordination and of marginalization of, of people that are different than the idea of the I I ideal uh, uh, Americanness. We see this with the development of immigration law, comparing, talking a little bit about history, but after the Chinese exclusion came these national origins quotas, and the or national origins quotas of 1921 versus 1924. In 1921, um, you know, they were trying to, to keep out the uh, Eastern and Southern Europeans from coming into the country. So it's always played out in different generations. And they did that by making uh, something like 4% 4, 4 of the, of the uh, census of the 1910 census, I think. And uh, during that time, uh, that didn't keep out enough uh, Eastern and Southern Europeans from coming into the country. Uh, they were still coming in because they had been part of the country by 1910. So three years later, they moved it down to 2% of the census count of 1890, rather than 1910, to make, it, make for a wider, uh, uh, a wider group of people that could come in that more closely matched what it meant to be an American. So that's a thread that's gone throughout our history. It's playing out in different ways now. It's more virulent now than it has been in a long time, but there certainly is the history behind it. And I would add to that uh, that um, perhaps um, the history of the United States is very much written in the history of immigration policy in the United States. And which is a way to legislate over inclusion and exclusion. Um. Thank you so much, everybody, especially the panelists. We really need to give them a big hand.